Uh, I'd now like to invite our next speaker, uh, uh, who is uh, Dr. Catherine Davison, who has a uh, uh, who is a bit of a leading authority in therapeutic drug monitoring of antimicrobials in Australia. She's led quite a few initiatives uh, through her roles within the, uh, within the Queensland system, through as director of the statewide antimicrobial stewardship team, through her work with ACT Health and also with the Safety Commission as well. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to welcome Catherine to, to present today. She's going to be talking to us about antibacterial PKPD targets. Thanks, Jason. Um, I always wait with bated breath about how Jason's going to um, introduce me um, and sometimes wonder why um, I've been given certain topics because um, I am not an academic PKPD person. Um, I'm not a microbiologist. Um, I'm an infectious diseases physician. Um, and essentially, I'm an interested clinician. Um, but I think a term for me better is a PKPD groupie um, with significant frustrations as to why we keep having the same discussions. Um, so essentially, I'm when I used to go to these talks many years ago, I just wanted that one slide where I could just take it and go back to clinical practice and use it. And that slide will be there. Um, but essentially, I'll be sort of waxing lyrical a little bit about um, why we don't have it as standard of care yet, um, and perhaps how we need to do that in our day-to-day -day practice, bacteria being the most common um, infectious diseases we see. So I think the issue is most uh, people who don't come along for the ride have this comment that they don't really believe in that PKPD stuff. Um, it's something I've heard certainly many times across the years, um, which is quite comical really. Um, so really we're gonna talk about uh, what sh this is and why it should matter to the clinician because if we don't take clinicians along in clinical care, then we're not actually going to optimize anything. Um, personally, I find uh, the PKPD of bacteria, fungus, everything academically interesting, but essentially it's a highly expert field. It's labor intensive, it's time consuming. People see it as unsustainable in current clinical practice. And because of that, they see it as clinically irrelevant. Um, when we've already seen in multiple lectures today, it's not. There's hard data for many clinical outcomes, length of stay, mortality, cost effectiveness across the board. Um, that really should mean that we integrate this into clinical care in a gold standard way as soon as possible. But the folly of those comments is that clinicians use PKPD in everyday practice and they don't actually realise it um, because they use microbiology reports. And everything we do um, in microbiology, well, not a microbiologist, everything the microbiologists do in microbiology is based somehow on PKPD and how it's used to predict clinical outcome or clinical efficacy. Um, and so I thought um, it was prudent to go through a few things that I don't think I was ever taught in my training um, explicitly, and I presume many others aren't, um, to understand how PKBB informs our day-to-day -day practice and then, um, you know, take those concepts through the rest of the lectures to work out how we can then provide that to our patients who have extremes of pharmacokinetics. Um, to provide individualised, optimised care. So essentially what happens is um, there's many different uh, PKPD studies. In some situations, it's done in a hollow fibre sort of um, scenario, as you've already seen with some of the studies um, that's been presented this morning, um, and historically more so um, large PKPD studies in clinical outcome, in clinical scenarios, which enable us to determine a correlation between exposure and effect of antibacterials, in this case, um, to clinical outcome. Um, it, those studies both help us to work out which PKPD indices is the most, index is the most important, and then work out within that uh, PKP index what target within that relationship we should be aiming for to try and work out the people who are more likely to respond to therapy and not um, as likely to respond to therapy. 
Then in the background, we are given um, historically, uh, but more so nowadays, um, experiments are done to see um, what clinical dosing regimens would be the best to try, um, which is a significant advance. But we're given dosing regimens historically either from the product information um, and now more commonly from uh, groups such as uh, CRE Reduce about what would be optimal um, dosing regimens to use. And then we try to work out how likely it is um, for those dosing regimens to be obtained in a general population um, of varying creatinines, varying um, volume of distributions, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that information is used in addition to some specific microbiological concepts to work out where we should be aiming um, our therapy. Um, and then... That information is taken and uh, a lot of microbiological concepts are worked through and, and then we have what might be um, more relevant for pathology reports, which is clinical um, uh, susceptibility um, breakpoints. Um, Jason's already uh, talked about various PKP indices, so I won't go through that and I'm sure the audience is very aware of all of uh, those concepts. Um, but essentially, the pharmacodynamic target is the minimum value uh, we aim for, depending on what we're trying to achieve. And these days, we're trying to achieve a lot. Um, so in some studies, we just want to actually suppress growth of the organism. Some studies, we want to decrease the growth of the organism. And those concepts in clinical practice would be important depending on what we think our host is like. So the more immunocompromised host, uh, we're more concerned about um, actually having a, a reduction in microbiological load. Um, we, um, you know, use clinical cure studies, which are the clinical outcome studies, uh, which sometimes are performed in humans, but uh, increasingly so because of the breadth of knowledge we require in animal studies. But increasingly, we also have pharmacodynamic targets for resistance, suppression of resistance development. And I think this is a field that increasingly we will be um, exploring in, in addition to optimising clinical outcomes for our patients in the era of increasing antimicrobial resistance. So um, the next um, step in that um, flowchart is actually trying to link the dose to where we think uh, people will respond. Um, and this is just one sort of example of how things are done. So we work out um, our preferred pharmacodynamic target, which in this case um, is showing uh, arbitrary uh, fractional time above MIC for keftazidine of 60%. And we work out if we're going to use one gram, watch um, TDS in the general population, what we're actually going to have to um, look for. But if we're using a reduced dose, then we uh, look for a lesser MIC that will be able to be um, obtained in clinical practice to get the exposure that we require. But actually, usually in a population, there's variation. And so the thing is that um, in when we're setting uh, pharmacodynamic targets and, and MICs, the people who uh, review all of this and put all the information together realise that not everyone will get uh, that target. And so they make a determination of how much of the proportion of the population they think is adequate um, to get that exposure. Um, and so we can see in some situations, um, if we're trying to get all of the population into a treatment um, bracket that has a MIC that can be measured in the laboratory and reported as susceptible, um, we need much higher doses. But if we accept that some people in the population won't reach that target, we can actually have a, a lower MIC um, for um, varying populations or a higher MIC um, if the dosing regimen is harder, um, easier to obtain. And so in all of these considerations where when we're reporting susceptibility results, we're actually thinking about how the population is exposed as opposed to an individual. And most of the data um, or lectures today will be talking about how at an individual level we can optimise dosing. And so then some of these MIC concerns actually um, fall away because if you can actually dose higher and, and achieve higher MICs, then you might open the range of antimicrobials available to an individual patient. Um, this paper's already been put up, um, but it's a great paper, um, and this is the one um, that you can find lots of references in. 
Um, and essentially, uh, Table 1 outlines uh, the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic indices um, and, and the values associated with antibacterial clinical efficacy and toxicity. Obviously, given it's a 20 minute lecture, um, I can't go into everything. So it's a summary slide. Um, and I think that's the one I would take away and use um, if I'm trying to individualize things for particular patients. Um, and then, you know, as required, seek expert advice on top of that. Um, so that's the paper I would go to um, as your first port of call if you want a summary overview of those four bacteria. Um, but in real life, what this means for clinical care is complex. So this is, you know, a common curve. Um, you go to a lecture like um, you know, the workshop today and you think you know lots and you think you can go out and do a lot of things. And then as you uh, know more about how things are done every day and the limitations of everything we do in clinical practice, um, you realise it's much more complicated than that. And the relevancy or the... Um, the way we go out and promulgate what we should be doing is a lot more uncertain with all the variables we have uh, to deal with to dose optimise appropriately. So in reality, um, not, so, not now in this particular situation, but historically, um, there um, was variability in certain testing regimens. So um, when the lab would actually report an MIC of whatever sort of antibacterial, um, there was concerns that was that a reliable MIC. So if we're going to dose optimise things for bacteria, as we were talking about earlier, we want to know what uh, the target for an MIC might be because it's the denominator. And if we don't have a reliable way of measuring that in the lab, then I don't know how we're going to achieve this. Um, and, you know, these things are identified in clinical practice and rectified as they are now in this particular circumstance, which was Piprisol and Tazobactam and certain um, testing in the lab. But when you've got that variability, you can't go forward with dose optimization for bacteria um, because there's that uncertainty. When you're looking at uh, dose optimization for bacteria, you have to realize that the drug and the bug interaction are very important. So it depends what drug you are um, dealing with and what bug you are dealing with, as the targets that are defined by the lab um, vary. So for example, E. coli um, and, and ampicillin, when you get a susceptible report for E. coli, um, you might have an MIC up to eight. And when you have a ampicillin um, susceptibility for enterococcus, it might be up to four. Um, and concerningly, yesterday I found out uh, that the E. coli and SUD uh, breakpoints of cuprocillin um, are quite different now in version 10 of the UCAS guidelines. But essentially, that now enables us to say that everything needs increased exposure for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it's actually just facilitating us providing better care. But you have to realise that one dose for one bug does not fit, uh, for all bugs, does not fit. Um, the, uh, the the dosing regimen that we should generally be using. We have to realise that there's syndrome differences as well. So, you know, one thing that seems susceptible um, in the blood may not be how it's being reported in the urine. And so using urine breakpoints um, or susceptibility testing to infer how we should be treating someone in the blood is not what we should be doing. So we have to make sure we have the appropriate sample to be able to target um, individualised dosing in bacteria um, more specifically. And essentially the host and, and how the, um, the host uh, pharmacokinetic sort of characteristics change what we should be doing. And so you can see in this um, paper, um, if we have a one size fits all to susceptibility or resistance um, in a population, we can't individualize doses for very somewhat predictable um, complex populations that we know about. Um, so we can see here that when we look at the targets that we might want to, or we could achieve on various dosing regimens, if we look at, say, for example, a patient with cystic fibrosis versus a patient in the ICU versus healthy volunteers, the, uh, the targets that we're able to achieve in a reliable way are quite variable. So having a report that says S for all of these different populations um, actually doesn't help me to know what I can do in that particular population. And so that's where individualised dose optimization um, helps us as well. And again, the amount of bug changes um, the efficacy of the drug. And we can see here that um, at a lower burden of bacteria, I think this 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 of uh, 
uh, bugs um, in a particular model um, and the effect of piperacillin and tazobactam, piptase can work um, because there's lower amount of um, bugs to target. But once we actually get to a higher concentration in the blood or a, an abscess or whatever it might be, the efficacy of the drug is much less. And so um, in real life, things are much more complex because we don't even know what inoculum we have in many populations. Um, and in the background of all of this, um, I think as Paul was alluding to, there are different um, approaches that we need to uh, in, in, yeah, um, implement in our clinical care based on our resources. But in actual fact, I don't think we should be um, adjusting our practice, we should just be advocating for optimal resources to provide gold standard care. And we can see, at, this is an antifungal study in Australia, we can see um, that even for something that has a lot of data, um, including Bayesian data now for the efficacy of TDM, we see that the turnaround time for even getting a serum concentration back is three to five days. And in fungal infections, that may be less important, but if that concept holds for bacteria, someone is septic and improved by that time. So the utility of using that is um, difficult. So who does care? Um, I think we all should care, um, but we need to take it from academically interesting and theoretically able to, uh, being able to be done to the floor of the clinical um, you know, ED or intensive care. And even though, um, you know, we have a number of highly skilled practitioners across Australia at the moment, um, it's still not there. And I think that's because while we all understand, at least in this room and online, um, how exposure of drugs actually lead to efficacy of microbiological cure and clinical cure, we have this um, overwhelming system within which we work. And that's the thing we need to deal with because I think we all have um, basic concepts of how to do this now, thanks to workshops such as these, which have been going on for many years now. Um, but we still don't, we still haven't worked out how to deal with the system within which we try to deliver this care. So if I had to think of how I would message this to a clinician or an executive and how we get to optimising PKPD and bacteria and clinical care, um, this is the hierarchy of how a clinician would think. They care about the diagnosis first. So if you have the wrong diagnosis, this post hoc individualised dosing doesn't really matter because we're treating the wrong thing. Um, we need to make sure we have the correct antimicrobial for the antibiogram. We need to make sure on a population basis, um, if we're not individualizing dosing at the point of care um, on admission, that we have a correct empiric dosing regimen. That's um, you know, a, a given. Um, we need to make sure we're sampling well so we can get to the bug, so we can individualise things. And then uh, we need to make sure we have the resources in place to enable post-op individualised dosing. So it's a lot to be done. Um, so if it was my pie in the sky, I would have everyone trained in the PKPD of bacteria. We'd have front-ended specialist practitioners enabling better target ascertainment at the point of care for specific populations. We'd have rapid turnaround of accessible serum concentrations to enable earlier dose optimization. Um, and we would have specific uh, susceptibility results by condition, host, and severity of illness. Um, and so, you know, this is one thing that I'd like to see in the future. And then we can all start to practice um, optimise PKPD for uh, bacterial infections more commonly. Um, but in reality, what we probably require is front-ended clinically experienced specialists um, supported by expert laboratories, both at the clinical chemistry and the microbiological level. And until we have that, um, we will continue to put up slides and talk about the academically interesting concepts of PKPD and how it um, affects clinical care, which we all know. Um, but uh, until we um, push through those barriers, then this is still likely to remain a relatively academic discussion, which I don't want to see it in clinical care because it's, we've been doing it for far too long. Um, but anyway, so I have finished. <laughs> Thanks very much, Catherine. I noted you called yourself an interested infectious diseases physician. I'd probably call you an interesting infectious <laughs> diseases physician, but interesting in all the, for all the good reasons. So thanks very much. That's an excellent presentation. Very good insights for how an infectious diseases physician or a physician more generally thinks about the, these concepts and uh, provides those of us that uh, may come from a slightly different viewpoint good um, 
rationale and uh, uh, a place from which we can reach out and have better discussions with people. So thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, there has been a uh, question that's come through about whether or not the slides will be available afterwards, and they will, uh, through the CRE Reduce uh, website. Uh, and so just look for those in, in coming days. Um, there's also another question from Jennifer about whether or not things antiretrovirals uh, are included in dosing softwares, and it all depends on the dosing software. It's inconsistent that the type of drugs that are included in different software, but uh, sometimes in discussion with the provider, as long as there's a, an adequately validated pharmacokinetic model, the software provider uh, may be willing to include that in there. So, but uh, I've no doubt that in, in some of the software, such as Best Dose, uh, does have some antiretrovirals. 